So uh, just to sort of uh, uh, get going on, on the, um, the retrospective. Uh, so yesterday, uh, we built on some introductory material that had been introduced Tuesday. Um, so uh, specifically on Tuesday, we had introduced um, a first couple uh, basic methods uh, that, that started to build some intuitions and familiarity with some of the needs in the data science area. Uh, we talked about calibration, this very basic method for estimating parameters based on, on uh, the, uh, the data we have from the world and theory as captured by the model. It tried to tune the particular assumptions uh, about of that model with respect to parameter values um, to allow the, the model to best match that empirical data. Um, it, 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 it believed hard that theory, it, it, it treated that theory as a given and, um, and sought to, to tune the particulars of the assumptions about that theory in the form of parameters to best match data. And that served two purposes. One is at a more prosaic level to make sure that that theory stayed true to, enjoyed fidelity to data, that in some sense that it was a plausible characterization of the patterns we see in the world. That's very important. Often we, we build a model and when we build the model, we have it start during, even if our primary focus is what if questions going far forward, even if our interest is looking, looking forward about what may be, what may become, or what the impacts of interventions or what if scenarios would involve. Very typically, I mean, it's, it's typical in our work that we will start the running of that model earlier. We will start it so that it overlaps with empir uh, the empirical time frame where we have data. And we do so, so that uh, as we start running the model, uh, we wanted to reproduce those patterns to reproduce the patterns that we see in the empirical time frame, And that lends us confidence that the model, that the theory rep represented in the model holds water, that it, it's consistent with empirical evidence. So often time frame will be divided up as it were into three phases, a time frame used for calibration, a time frame used for validation, where we're using the model with calibrated parameters, we run it and we make sure that it reproduces those patterns. And then a, a historic, non-historic time frame, a future time frame where it runs forward. Um, calibration um, though at a more, at a deeper level is, is about challenging our models. It's about failing early and failing often. It's about finding cherished model assumptions that just don't add up to be consistent with the data. And uh, as such, it's a key part of this idea of modeling is learning. Models are learning tools. They're not perfect representations of the world. They're not crystal balls. They're tools for, they don't have and necessarily hold the truth, but they speed us on our way towards the truth by discovering when our thinking is off base, when our understanding is off base. And that could be our personal understanding, but it could be collective understanding. And calibration will often bring those matters to bear. That, that was Tuesday. And, and we also saw Tuesday, uh, some elements of hidden Markov modeling, this modeling where we were trying to use data from the world together with some probabilistic characterization of system evolution in a way that fused the two. Um, it informed an understanding of what was going on at any one time, not just based on model theory articulated in this probabilistic way, but on observed data. And, uh, and, and so we were always getting cross-checked in our understanding of what was going on by the data. The data was ambiguous. The data was perhaps sometimes missing or incomplete or, or um, you know, very, very noisy, but 
um, because the system being in a certain state would make certain data more likely or less likely, seeing that data would start to whisper to us what state we might we were likely to be in. But the other thing we took into account is how the system um, uh, evolved from the uh, uh, from past states. So, so that was a, those were some core ideas of of hidden Markov modeling, and um, it turns out that that presages it. it anticipates what we see in particle filtering. Particle filtering, which we covered yesterday, considered a continuous state, whereas hidden Markov model considered a discrete state. But in particle filtering too, depending on what state the system was in, if there are a lot more people needing, you know, an early stage suicidal ideation, uh, we might see a, a level of services that was, should be correspondingly higher, for example. Um, or some period after that, we might expect to tragically see see um, attempts of people, you know, people attempting to take take their own lives, and um, and so certain states of the system will make certain data more likely to be observed. And particle filtering took advantage of that with likelihood functions, formal likelihood functions. We have kind of a simplified version of that in hidden Markov modeling. And like with hidden Markov modeling, the data coming in clues us into what's going on, but so does our confidence about where the system has been recently. And both those combine to give us a picture of what's going on right now. And from that, we can project forward. So hidden Markov model was kind of like this small laboratory uh, associated with that. and. Um, I'll have to double check to make sure I've given you some, some hidden Markov model code for those interested in it, but it can be a very effective tool for, for allowing us to understand um, what state we're in right now. But more than that, it can help in model identification, help in model identifying model parameters, um, identifying the driving dynamics of that model, how it evolves over time. Um, those can be estimated using using data from the world, and so it is with uh, with particle filtering and particle MCMC. Uh, sure, glad to provide the HMM code, and you know if there's questions about that, um, I know one of the TAs here, um, uh, Xiaoyan Li, uh, the queen of particle filtering, um, uh, she worked with me creating that code. Uh, and would be glad to discuss it. Uh, you know, I would also, but she should be free to be grabbed at many points during the boot camp um, if, if you want to discuss that code. So I'll try to do that over the break that's coming up. But another method that we introduced in, on, on uh, Tuesday was, was approximate Bayesian computation. And that allowed us to, um, to move beyond calibration. It was, it was also a way of estimating parameter values for models while assuming a fixed model structure. Um, but it allowed us to reason about many possible values of parameters that might give suitable accounting for the world. And, um, and yesterday, um, we built on these methods. So we, we had, MCMC and MCMC had a much more nuanced way of assessing alternative parameter, possible parameter values, rather than saying parameters which gave it this. So in approximate Bayesian computation, we said any parameter combination, which any assumptions about parameters that allowed the model to match with this within a certain discrepancy was considered good, and we we would use it. Otherwise, we wouldn't. But MCMC, we we used a lot more ones that gave really close matches. And we would only occasionally, we would only consider, you know, it far less frequently ones um, that, that had bigger imbalances, big, uh, fewer matches. In other words, where the posterior was low probability or high probability would be reflected in whether, whether we considered these parameters combinations frequent or infrequently versus frequently, respectively. In other words, 
MCMC provided us a way to sample from parameter values, the probability of drawing each proportional to its, to the posterior distribution, the probability of that combination in light of the data. So it, it provided us this way to take this model structure, which was a given, and, and look uh, at the world, um, see what the data is telling us, and listen, what is it kind of a way to transform data observed from the world and that given that model structure into, into probabilities that this parameter, that this parameter combination um, is the case, or this one, or this one, or this one. It lets us take that data from the world and turn it into to, uh, assessments of plausible values of parameters. Um, and uh, as such, it's very powerful. Now, one thing I didn't talk about um, much, but I, I noted in passing, is that MCMC can be used to look at different models. So we're not only finding plausible parameters, we're finding plausible models. And I'll come back to that this afternoon when we come to inferring aspects of model structure, um, sort of identifying models that are more plausible and parameters that go with them and models that are less plausible parameters that go along with them, sampling from models together with their parameters, which is a very powerful thing you can do. Fairly straightforward, quite straightforward if the parameter spaces are the same, if those different models have the same possible parameters. It's much more complicated if you have different parameters that apply for the different models. Um, so that was, um, MCMC. Now, MCMC was used for deterministic models. Um, we then went on, though, to a, to a type of approach that in its practical application, in its philosophical implications, um, and in its goals were, were quite different. And that is particle filtering. Particle filtering is part of what is known as sequential Monte Carlo methods as contraposed with uh, the batch Monte Carlo of Markov chain Monte Carlo. Particle filtering um, is sequential Monte Carlo in the sense that it's designed to take data over time into the system. With MCMC, if we get new data in, well, we'll perform MCMC again with this new data. New data point comes in, arrives for a new time point, time to restart the MCMC. You can get some, secure some economies and we do in our work by taking like the samples of the parameter value, plausible parameter values that we got with a smaller set of data, say yesterday. And now that the new data has arrived, you start with that as the initial sample it's a good starting point for thinking about the parameters and sample from there. But really, you have to consider the full set of data again. Particle filtering has this way of incrementally consuming data. It's a recursive technique. You, you derive the particle weights in, in the state estimate using earlier data. A new data point comes in. You just update those weights that you had computed before. You don't have to go back and reconsider all the earlier data. No, 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 no. You just update the weights. You multiply each weight by the likelihood for that. So multiply the weight of a particle by the likelihood for that particular particle of having observed this empirical data. That's the so-called condensation algorithm. And you update. So it's it has a strategy for incrementally sort of sipping the data, the incoming data. And in that sense, it's ideally suited to streams of data, data where each day we're getting new, new, a bit of new data in. Now, the, the real world is more complicated than that. And, you know, uh, with these methods being used as bread and butter techniques to inform, you know, all, all the provinces of Canada on a regular basis and nine of them, you know, in two different ways for First Nations as well as for the general, the entire population. And then for our system here daily, uh, using wastewater data as well. Um, we, um, 
we often had to deal with the fact that, you know, we don't actually get each, just each new day, we get new data points. We actually have revisions to earlier data points. So they reclassify someone, you know, from this region versus that region. Someone's in the hospital in an urban center and was originally counted as being from that urban center. And then they realize, oh, that person's from a community in the North. So they reclassify it three days after they were originally recorded and that data point earlier is revised. And particle filtering can be adapted very nicely for those techniques as well. I don't have time to go into it here, but our automated architecture allowed handling that in a very elegant sort of way without reconsidering all earlier data points. And this, this allows us to do really, really rich particle filtering, you know, in hundreds of thousands of particles every day generating these reports involving projections. It could be used for what if scenarios and for estimating the current state of the system um, day in, day out. Um, so um, that's, that's effective, but the point is that it can accommodate you know, data messiness and the fact that you have to go back several days to, to modify um, the data. Um, so particle filtering is this approach which you know, has a certain philosophical similarity to ensemble approaches where we're considering many alternative models. Here, it's not so much we have different models, but we have different hypotheses that are, that are trying to best explain the observed data. And they are competing with each other to explain that data. And the weight we attach to each such particle and characterize sort of uh, the pedigree of that particle, how good it's been at, at explaining the data. Um, but, you know, it behooves us in particle filtering to be somewhat accommodating to allow a particle that may not have been that great at predicting things to persist for some time with a low weight because it may be a contrarian particle for good reason. It may be that it po it's positing, for example, for the past five days, it's been positing that there's a hidden outbreak and we don't see it yet. And we don't see it yet. And we don't see it yet. It of course is characterizing if there were such an outbreak, how would it be growing? Regardless of how many people are getting reported, you know, how would it be growing? And then lo and behold, if there is an outbreak, you know, if, if suddenly data comes in of, oh my gosh, you know, in this community, uh, because of community trust issues, um, a bunch of cases went, you know, undiagnosed for a long time. Suddenly we have a spate of cases being identified. Um, you know, we've got this particle on it. It's been anticipating it and it takes, and it starts to have a much larger weight and it flourishes and is fruitful and multiplies and, and becomes a, a very important player in the, the picture being given out by the particle filtering. We want a certain diversity. We want a certain accommodation for naysayers or contrarian voices, dissenters. Um, but at the same time, that can't go on forever. And if there's a particle that's you know, been for weeks and weeks out to lunch, uh, we want it to be, um, to bring it to rain and, and uh, it, it, it will probably go extinct at some point in the resampling process. So particle filtering is about listening to these different voices, investing in those that are consistent, but tolerating those that are, that are contrarian or that, are, um, that are, are dissenting in a way that is thoughtful. Um, but at the same time, recognizing because of the limited number of particles we can have, say a few hundred thousand, we can't forever tolerate all possible, you know, hypotheses about the situation. That just isn't possible. Um, Shoyan did mention that as the state space of the model grows, as the number of pieces of information you need to keep track of to characterize the current situation in the model grows, you need more particles in general because you want to you want to have a reasonably dense set of possibilities that you're examining, these different hypotheses. You, you don't want them to be super sparse. You'd like, 
you'd like them to kind of fill that space with, with different possibilities. Now I'm simplifying the situation in a number of ways, but the basic picture is solid there, that um, if you have a richer model, a case in point would be a, a discrete event simulation model or an agent-based model, which can be used, in fact, with particle filtering. Um, then you need lots of particles because there's lots of state in that model. Um, if it's a very, very simple SEIR model, you could do it with fewer particles. Our COVID-19 model um, was used with, you know, we would run it with fewer particles and we would run it with more to test where does it, where does it give really reproducible results? Where is it very reliable? And we found that, you know, we we didn't trust it if it was fewer than seventy five thousand particles um, that were it was used for once it was full size. Um, um, mind you, that is dozens of of states and so on with diagnosis and with vaccination now and with with uh, asymptomatic individuals and symptomatic individuals. But we we found that if we ran it with fewer than seventy five thousand particles it could give variable results, maybe not every day, but it would give results that'd be kind of jumpy and, and to give really reliable results, we wanted something more than that. Um, once we started to subscript it by, in other words, have it represent the different regions of the province and their interactions, we needed more particles yet um, to be reliable. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a pragmatics associated with that on, on the number of particles. Um, there was also pragmatics about which data we considered um, and, and the likelihood functions. Um, but, but particle filtering models, um, as you saw yesterday from Cheyenne's presentation, um, can be very, very effective at matching the data. Um, here at a philosophical level, it's not believing hard uh, in the underlying dynamic model in the way calibration does or approximate Bayesian computation does in, in a traditional deterministic model. Um, instead, it's, it's more accommodating. Your model has stochastics in it, which reflect um, you know, a sort of epistemically healthy attitude that maybe maybe we're off, maybe, um, you know, maybe we have omissions, maybe we have blind spots, maybe there's some parts of dynamics we don't understand. And we capture that by these parameters that wander. We're not quite sure what their values were. And, and by transitions that are probabilistic and not merely deterministic. And that gives it a requisite variety of hypotheses, which is healthy. You want those hypotheses, that diversity of views. Um, and if you just bullheadedly say, this is the theory and that's it, you have a very narrow set of views. So philosophically, it's a kind of pluralistic uh, tradition. And you tune the degree of that stochastics to allow those diversity of voices to be broader. Um, but as you saw from Cheyenne's situation, from Cheyenne's results yesterday, and those were results that are good four years old now or, or, or something, you know, you, uh, you can get amazingly good matching to the observed data. Um, when you have it informed by each data point, it, it um, can very closely match the sort of twists and turns of the observed data historically. But that's not curve fitting. Again, it's not, it's not because it's trying to match that curve. No, 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 no. It's, what it's doing is when it sees these data, it's interpreting what is this telling me about my underlying situation. And the reason it's so accurate, and particularly the reason why it can predict reasonably well, quite well with that high area under the curve, high sensitivity and high specificity when there's gonna be outbreak is because it captures the structure of the system. It captures the fact that over time, if you haven't seen many cases, the number of susceptibles is building up. 
that's in the theory captured by the model. And when you're estimating the underlying state of the system based on the data you've observed, no cases this month, very few cases this month, very few cases this month, it, the particles, the only particles that are, that are seeing that um, and that are gonna be current are ones that are building up susceptibles, building up susceptibles. So, it, so when you see those data points come in, you're gonna be investing in particles, boosting the weights of particles that are saying, oh, there's a growing number of, part uh, no, growing number of susceptibles. There's a growing number of susceptibles. I mean, growing, growing, growing the expectation that there's, you know, it's like you're, it's getting bone dry. It's getting ready for a fire here. Uh, we're building up the, the kindling on the ground. We're building up susceptibles. We're building it up. It's just ripe for an outbreak. Um, and so that's why it's able to sort of anticipate there's going to be an outbreak soon, um, uh, very likely. It's because the particles are capturing the underlying situation. They know if you haven't seen these these cases for a while, it's because you're, you know, it's because um, uh, they're not occurring and therefore we're having people who more and more people are susceptible. And that makes, because of the theory captured, adhered to by all particles, that makes it increasingly likely there's going to be an outbreak. That's what allows it to be so effective. Um, it's that capturing of the the underlying intrinsic dynamics of kind of the logic of the system that allows it to match so closely that empirical data, um, even on, a, on an age-specific basis, and that allows it to project forward so effectively because it's capturing the logic of the situation, the, the sort of um, natural dynamics of that situation. Uh, and it's doing so through those observations. Um, and that allows it to ask what if questions uh, as well in a way that is grounded by the current situation. So when we see those, those matches to curves, bear in mind, it's not because we're inherently seeking, it, we're doing something to make it match those curves. No, we're seeking to lend it an understanding of the logic of the situation that it will of necessity match those curves given an understanding of what this empirical data is telling us in the logic of the underlying system. So that's what particle filtering is doing. It's, it's interpreting this data from the world as it informs us about what it must mean about the underlying situation to make sense of that data. That data is whispering to us about the underlying situation and the Rosetta Stone for not a good analogy. And the, the way in which we understand those whispers is through the lens of the, of the, um, the, the theory about the system as captured by the model. That's what particle filtering is at some levels. But there's, you know, there's many specifics there. Um, there's this important sampling idea that particles are weighted and no one particle changes its mind, not those contrarian ones, not the the sort of more conventional thinkers, but rather we change our, how much we listen to one of those particles versus the other based on how, how uh, effective they've been. And then eventually some of them die out uh, through, through this resampling technique. Um, uh, so that, that was uh, particle filtering. There, there's quite a lot of additional detail there, but um, I think I'm, I'm pretty happy that What's been conveyed there is the basic idea. You're running the model kind of in parallel for these hypotheses between observations. And when an observation occurs, then there's this accounting, this update to the weights that reflects credibility. Those that are consistent with the data are upweighted. Those that are inconsistent with the data have their weights reduced. And then there's this Grim Reaper that, that um, that leads to the survival of the fittest uh, periodically when we have too many particles around with really, really low weights. Um, we're looking for at least an effective, effective sample size of at least certain threshold. So we don't have 99% of our particles carrying super low weights, for example. Um, 
uh, particle filtering um, to really apply it in practice um, benefits from tuning. Um, it's not incredibly hard to build a particle filter model. Um, in, in our opening um, slides on that method, I mentioned this vision of, of um, you know, being able to build rapidly models based on a new situation, very rapidly build them, and then to get them to learn from empirical data. And one can do this. Our first particle filtering models for, for COVID-19 were available in March, 2020. Um, you know, the, the month that it was, the, uh, the pandemic was declared um, and starting to produce reasonable results either by late March or early April. Um, and so you can quickly formulate a model, a rough and ready model, parameterize it with some data, but get it to learn from data and set it going and tune it. But really tuning it lasted a couple more months to get it to sing, to get it to, to just behave very reliably and in a very um, and in very you know in a fashion that really matched the data well. And it required thinking about our mental model, our, our theory, and challenging it and incorporating asymptomatic or oligo or post-asymptomatic, or if you want to put it, um, pathways, for example, et cetera. Um, active case finding, um, distinguishing that from packed, passive case finding. So distinguishing uh, cases where people come in because they're ill, present for care and show up because they're symptomatic versus cases where we're going out and beating the bushes. We're running mass testing sites or we're running, we're running contact tracing, which can find asymptomatic individuals as well. Those draw from different, the mechanics of it, of how it affects the system, uh, what parts of the state of the system are affected or different. In one case, you're focused on symptomatic individuals and the other, you're focused on a broader set of individuals who could be symptomatic or not, if you're testing people who are not symptomatic. So, um, uh, so we saw some components yesterday of, of particle filtering and we um, discussed some elements of it. We also discussed how it could be used to incorporate uh, wastewater data by having a, and this is true for particle filtering in general, when we're comparing, when we want the particle filter, we want to build a particle filter informed by some data, there needs to be structure in the model as being particle filtered that can be used to characterize expectations of what data we should observe from the world. So if you're comparing against wastewater data, we need some structure in the, part of, in the, in the underlying simulation model that says what the wastewater level would be given the particle state. And that involves, for example, reasoning about the shedding population, people who are shedding virus. Uh, it involves reasoning about how that shedding population translates into actual wastewater measurements. Similarly, if you're, you have data from the world on test positivity, you want something in your simulation model that computes test positivity. So you're going to need to represent tests, for example. Um, or if, uh, if you want to compare it with deaths, there needs to be a death flow in your model. There needs to be something corresponding to, to compare the model with data, there needs to be something that corresponds to that data from that model. And that sometimes shapes, you know, what's left in the, what's put in the model and what's not. It's one of the ways in which systems data science leads us to structure our models a bit differently so that we can systematically compare them with the world. Um, so particle filtering is a very, very powerful technique. Um, it can yield very good results when we have theory. And we can use it with different theories. We could try with different models and see which of them yield better results. It can be used to estimate the current situation to project forward in light of our understanding of the current situation and ask what if questions. Where our understanding of the current situation is constantly being updated, challenged, uh, refined, 
by new observations that we have. Like with hidden Markov modeling, any observation from the world can be is, is imperfect, fallible, and often very noisy and ambiguous. But if we observe them over time, together with the dynamics of the situation, it often starts to give a very clear picture. It, it's like being able to triangulate from many sources um, or get that image of a 3D picture of the body from a CAT scan by knitting together many very limited uh, X-rays from different angles, uh, each very limited. Uh, so particle filtering gives us this way of kind of listening to diverse data from the world, meshing it with theory that accommodates many views, many alternative understandings, and invests in those that are more consistent with the data. Um, particle filtering uh, is a technique which uh, can be applied for many systems and can in principle be applied for agent-based modeling and discrete event simulation, although that's uh, still sort of on the, the cutting edge um, because of the sizes of the, the state spaces involved particularly. Um, we finished up uh, yesterday with a discussion of uh, 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 not just wastewater data, but smartphone data. And a uh, Marvi gave a demonstration of this Ethica platform. In some past versions of this bootcamp, I've uh, taken some time to show how we bring together that data with simulation models. And over the last decade and a half, we've had diverse, rich, different ways of bringing data observed from smartphones together with simulation. And it occurs in a couple of ways. One way is by parameterizing the model. We have contact patterns from, or mobility patterns from, from the world, from participants, and we feed them into the model, or we feed some, some generalization of them into the model, you know, based on how long contacts take place and how many, the, you know, the, the distribution of contacts people have in the course of the day as picked up with smartphones. In other cases, it provides data that we calibrate a model to, or that we particle filter a model to, or use common filtering for. Um, and in any case, it gives us some grounding often in human behavior that is otherwise uh, burdensome to record things like mobility behavior, contact behavior, um, physical activity and sedentary behavior, uh, eating patterns, um, and then health, health beliefs, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and, and behaviors um, can also be captured uh, well through these systems. So the Ethica platform that was shown you know, allows essentially creating these, these health apps, um, which can be customized. They can be given custom skins and looks and feels, but otherwise can be rolled out very, very quickly with no programming. And, um, and which can collect for some studies uh, where people consent um, uh, and, and explicitly give permission on their phone, collect certain types of, uh, of sensor data, S you know, screen time data, for how long people are, are on the phone looking at the screen or data on, on uh, people's, uh, people's uh, physical activity as measured through accelerometry or through steps, et cetera. Um, uh, it can evidence model assumptions, either qualitatively or quantitatively about behavior. Um, and as such, it's a flexible tool for understanding behavior over time. And in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been uh, very, very eye-opening for shedding light on, for example, mask use and, and uh, how that might differ in different regions or, or gathering participation um, as volunteered information by people or, or um, 
uh, changes in people's perceptions of the need for booster vaccines, for example. Um, it, it gives this longitudinal portrait for, for de-identified individuals that can really help understanding dynamics. Uh, with long COVID, uh, we're using it to understand how COVID, sim long COVID symptoms change over time, um, uh, care-seeking patterns, uh, the degree to which people are uh, successful or not successful in seeking care, uh, therapeutics or, or, or uh, medications, pharmaceuticals that they are using, and ways in which the symptomology is evolving in light of additional vaccinations, et cetera. Um, gives very, very rich longitudinal portraits, which can be very helpful for grounding model assumptions, say in our long COVID agent-based modeling, of which we have a couple lines. Um, uh, it can be very useful to, to sort of start to parameterize some assumptions there. Um, and uh, so in my view, tools for big data collection, whether it's search data, longitudinal also, whether it's social media data, Twitter, Reddit, whether it's smartphone data, whether it's wastewater data, um, and other data sources as well, can be really formidable tools for informing model assumptions. Um, they can be formidable tools for grounding our models, for providing us basis to calibrate, to filter in a particle filter type way, to parameterize, um, and otherwise to just uh, ground our theory and to build our theory that's captured in the models. Often we see patterns there that that we need to explain. Focus groups might explain them further um, as we're running for our long COVID, and then we we use it in our um, uh, in our in our uh, model assumptions as well. So these are tools for gathering additional understanding of patterns in the world that our models can capture. Uh, now, today we have some some quite exciting stuff that. Um, builds on yesterday, but but takes it further. So um, we're going to be going through a set of case studies of uh, particle filtering. You know, I've been going through further participant survey responses. I'm so grateful that most people have filled that out now, and and that's informed my understanding of people's interests. Um, so we're going to have a couple more particle filter case studies, um, and uh, and following that we're going to be talking about uh, particle or Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, which take the best of Markov chain Monte Carlo in terms of estimating parameter values together with uh, particle filtering. And I'll probably also talk a little bit about use of particle filter with calibration now, which is another favorable combination we've exploited. Um, uh, now, having done that, that will sort of, flesh out some of the aspects of particle filtering that we saw. And particularly, we'll be talking about sampling from trajectories, not just sampling at any one time what the situation is, but sampling stories about what's happened over time. In a way, we do with Viterbi algorithm and, and hidden Markov models. This is something we do with particle filtering. Um, but then we're going to take things in a very different direction. Um, well, we'll have a case study that that shows uh, shows use of PMCMC, one of several uses we've employed it um, in in projects. This one involving uh, opioid um, opioid abuse in Cincinnati and in Alberta, um, uh, and uh, we'll be using uh, big data for that as well as traditional data. And PMCMC will provide this way of looking into areas of the system that are that are less well evidenced through publicly available data sources, such as aspects of illicit use, et cetera. After we do that, um, we're going to be moving on to a quite different topic that will that will sort of accompany us through the end of this boot camp, and that is um, the issue of uh, techniques that are less beholden to theory. That is, that are um, 
that that deduce theory at some level from data rather than than capturing theory in our models and best aligning the particulars of the assumptions with data like we do in calibration or approximate Bayesian computation um, or MCMC rather than just taking a theory and admitting some sort of um, stochastics around that theory as we do with filtering techniques, uh, common filtering and particle filtering. What these techniques are actually doing is, is allowing us to deduce um, aspects of structure that may be hidden in the data. And so we're, we'll start with a discussion of a model-free technique known as shadow, shadow manifold reconstruction and, and, and embedding that allows us to, it's a very practical technique for taking data and turning it to greater use um, that can be used very handily in monitoring data coming out of a system of whatever sort. Um, but it also sets us up for peering into the state space of these models. And then we'll talk about model structure discovery, deep learning and dynamic modeling with much of this work using deep learning approaches. Um, there's some really neat aspects of learning that are cutting edge right now, but are advancing rapidly, which leverage neural architectures, deep learning um, to deduce structure in light of patterns and data. There are limitations of such techniques along many lines. One of the foremost ones being recognizing causal versus non-causal connections. But the capacities of these techniques to, to recognize the, the structure that drives dynamics that's observed has some really profound uses in terms of anticipating system evolution in a way that also takes into account sort of the regularities of system behavior and potentially system state. So we're gonna talk about some cutting edge work there. That work is quickly evolving um, and I'll be giving some references to, um, to resources for learning more about it. And finally, we'll be finishing up the boot camp, um, having introduced that with some guidelines for choosing among methods. Um, so sitting back, taking stock of the cacophony of different methods, considered in this boot camp, what, you know, what guidelines could be offered for when one might use one method versus another. And I'll be sharing some structure for that. Um, some, some, um, uh, some reflections on how to choose and some points of, you know, rules of thumb for sort of choosing a bug among these different techniques. Um, uh, and and uh, that, will, that will sort of close out um, uh, the discussions uh, of the bootcamp. So um, that's what's on the bill for today. Uh, are there any questions people would like to advance for discussion? I, I so value um, the discussions we're having here and I would welcome if anyone wants to speak up, report anything in the chat now, I'd be glad to um, to comment on it. I'd also uh, value it if, if you want to make any requests or anything. I'd be be happy to uh, to consider them here, and I'll be trying to act on the ones that have already been talked about. So, anyone want to put something forward there? Chat is quiet right now. Anyone? Going once, going twice. Maybe your interest. Oh, uh, will this session be posted as video? Absolutely. Um, uh, yes. So I've been systematically posting my retrospectives, and this one will be amongst them. So we'll make sure it gets posted. Um, I'll do my best to make sure it's by the end of the day. Yeah. Thanks very much. 
Anything else people want to put forward? Yeah, no. Glad to do that. Glad if it's if it's useful. I, I do these things spontaneously. Um, and uh, it's always good to hear that my my musings <laughs> offer, <laughs> offer some 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 help. Um, uh, sometimes it helps make these spontaneous connections that um, otherwise are lost as you sort of progress the material. This is something we've learned from past boot camps. People like a little bit of reflection on what what is what has occurred, and at the cost of doing so, even without you know without props or what have you. Great. Well, um, I, I appreciate the feedback. If these are valuable, that's great, and and to hear that they're worth you know, um, recording and posting is, is good to know. Um, because I have caught myself wondering if it's just something that speaks to people at the original event. But um, okay, so what we're going to do now is um, I'll stop the recording, uh, we'll take, um, uh, take about a five minute break. Um, and uh, then we'll jump in to um, some of these particle filtering case studies that will take us through the morning. Um, and uh, I'll be delivering three such case studies um, that hopefully will you know, give some pointers for, for how part of particle filtering can be fruitfully used, including with aspects of big data. And in a very provocative uh, fashion, led by Shayan, can be used to to give a whole bigger than the sum of the parts for multiple conditions at once. So I'm really excited to give this. Um, okay, so we'll stop now and we'll be back in five minutes. Thanks very much.